lot of um, individual goalie coaches where the kid comes to you, say, once a week. Um, in the child's mind, that is their coach. The head coach of the hockey team is just somebody that is running their team. And so the one that they're going to be most comfortable with, the one that is, you know, talking the same language as, the, as them, playing the same sport, because really goaltending is a completely different sport, um, is that goalie coach. And so I think there is this extra feeling of affinity for your goalie coach um, versus your head coach of your hockey team, who is, you know, simply disseminating information at the board. I mean, that's, they are rarely telling you anything. They are rarely helping or hurting your, you know, it's basically like, go, go stop the puck. Um, rarely drills are made for you. So there is this whole other aspect of it that you're almost floating in as this child that plays a different sport into a team and you get to be part of a team. But then you get this one-on-one -on -one relationship and a lot of goalies stay with that same goalie coach. I mean, Sandy is a great prime example. They'll come to that him when they're young and they stay with him for a decade. And so that you can imagine that relationship and yet head coaches will constantly change. Um, so they're the ones that are the counselors, like Tom said, they're the ones that are, you know, ups and downs with uh, family life or anything that's going on in their world or school. They tend to be that, that person for them too. So um, I think there's a whole other level of, um, of trust that goes on between those two and, uh, Often that goalie coach never actually sees them play in a game. They might get some video, you know, but they um, they are that person like a teacher in a classroom to so many others as well. No, it's a great point about like engaging the goalies and being a counselor. I mean, I always I always went out of my way because I figured if my goalies aren't happy, we're probably not winning a lot of hockey games. Um, you know, but in coaching the junior and midget level, right? I try to empower them as, as much as possible. Hey, if you know, if this drill isn't working or you're exhausted because we've done it for too long or, or what have you, like, let me know. Right. Yeah. Because um, that's great. Know, Another thing, Kim, too, is to force them to watch the drill when you uh, write it out and make them understand it, um, because um, you want your that that is teaching hockey IQ often as goalies. And I did this for sure. You go over to the board and it's your chance to rest because you've been exhausted and you just you pretend like you're paying attention and you're nodding, but are you really nodding? When I went to teach, when are you really understanding? When I went to teach and be a head coach on the ice for the first time, I knew how every drill ended, but I was like, what, it, what, where does it even start? I had to like think back to like so many drills that I'd seen and I didn't really understand what happened in the neutral zone because I was only seeing what was in my zone. So force your goalies to watch the drill and to understand the concepts of angling and of all of the things that you teach, pressure, back pressure, um, because I think that that's going to elevate your goalie to the next level and something that a lot of coaches don't do for the goalies. Um, so get them to really have that hockey IQ first and foremost, and that will help them be able to scan better and be able to read the play better too. Sammy, I've got a, a point. When I talk about goalies, I talk about back catchers. How many of them become general managers? Because mm -hmm. they see the game. They watch the game. And they're in a primary position of responsibility. And I think what you're doing, and you're suggesting in terms of them being much more alert to what's going on all over the ice, there should be more goalie graduates becoming coaches. Well, if you look at any, I would say that 50% of the main analysts on uh, and play-by-play -play people on Hockey Night in Canada have been goalies. So it's interesting that, um, yeah, lots will go into that. I think, you know, part of it is we just see it so differently that it makes it unique. And um, I think people really appreciate that information that we're giving them because they don't know it. So it's easy to kind of give that information. Um, but yeah, I would say I certainly struggled when I started in um, well, coaching and in, in an analyst role of like figuring out, you know, how many times in my life did Wally say man on box behind? 
And yeah, I knew that that's what we were supposed to be doing. But like when I actually saw it on the ice and was able to disseminate it, I was like, oh, that's what he meant. Oh, that's exactly what he meant. Uh, but I'd never watched for it. I was simply a fan when I was watching the game when I was in net. And that's the thing when you're watching, when you're in a three hour game, um, you know, don't necessarily have your goalies at that time read the play outside of the red line because you don't want to be mentally focused for three hours either. You need to give your brain a, a chance to relax. So when the goal, the plays in the other end, you can just kind of live vicariously through the big moments of your team. You don't have to be totally focused. Um, and that was another thing that, you know, you need to, you need to chill for a little bit because some goalies, um, and we've all played with them are like so on the whole time. And by the end, they're just burnt out and they tend to struggle late in the third period. So, 